Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, particularly the high school students who are here to hear my talk tonight. Um, as you, as Dr. Ager has stated, and as you may guess from the picture, I am a plant biologist. And I teach, one of the courses I teach here is genetics. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about genetics and then about how to generate giant flowers. How many of you in this room, you students, think that flowers are important? Oh, good. Why are flowers important? Any reason? Yes. It's just like the sun is going out there. They kind of like um, they absorb the sun to get the synthesis. Mm -hmm. They the help in the production <laughs> of oxygen. Yes. They're pretty. They're pretty. <laughs> Exactly. Many of the seeds that they produce are part of the food chain. Yes. And many flowers and plants that they do use, like they use them to make different sorts of medicine and remedies and stuff. Exactly. Many of them have medicinal properties. Yes. Even for commercial reasons, a lot of flowers are used in the business industries for weddings, for decorations. It's exactly. one of the main objects that we use for decorative purposes. Absolutely. All very good reasons. Also, if it's Valentine's Day or Mother's Day, or if you need to um, make up with your, with, your, with your girlfriend and you don't have any other way to say it but without words, then uh, a bunch of flowers will always do the trick. But, and so, um, I don't know if, how many of you know, but actually the, the ornamental industry in Florida only, is an industry of $7 billion. And that covers flowers and all ornamentals. So of course now, from the scientific point of view, there's many other reasons why flowers are important. But just for commercial purposes, scientists are always trying to make larger and prettier flowers for the industry. And well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit by saying giant flowers, you know, we're not talking about monstrous flowers, but we're talking about flowers that are larger than the ones you will see. So before I go into the actual topic, which is, um, as a matter of fact, something that I'm currently doing here at St. Thomas University in my research lab, I am working with flowers uh, with the purpose of um, inducing change in chromosome number as to, so as to make them larger. And so I'm going to go a little bit on the genetics of uh, behind giant flowers. Genetics. Anyone want to give me a definition of what genetics is for you? Any of the high school students? Back there, yes? Okay, so the word genetics contains the word genes. genes. So genetics is going to be, in general, we can say it's a study of heredity. We can also say it's a study of how genes determine characteristics and how these characteristics are passed from the parents to the progeny. What you're seeing here are two different eyes. This, of course, the eye of a human, but this is the eye of a Fruit fly, very good. And they are both considered eyes, and yet how different they are. And that's because the genes in the human are different from the genes that determine the eye, the, the form and the color of the eyes in fruit flies. And so this information that determines characteristics, where is it stored? DNA. DNA. Where else? Any other words? Genes, DNA, chromosomes. Heard this word? You've heard those words before. How are these three words related? How are these three concepts related? As you see in this picture, here's a human cell. And inside the cell, there's a nucleus. 
And inside the nucleus, we have the chromosomes that determine their characteristics. But if you were to take one of the chromosomes and stretch it out, you will see that it's actually made of DNA. You guys have heard about DNA before. DNA is a molecule that's actually a double helix, and part of the DNA is made of these nitrogenous bases, this green and purple portion of the DNA. And those are called nucleotides. So you have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine as part of the DNA. Have you heard those words before or maybe seen these letters before? Yes. How many of you watched Jurassic Park? In Jurassic Park, it's a fiction, of course, but we had the scientists finding portions of the DNA from dinosaurs and were able to reconstruct the whole dinosaurs. And so these letters then are familiar to you. Let's see how these letters actually determine genes. Here is a representation of a DNA molecule that has been stretched out. And you can see, uh, you can imagine that the whole sequence is made of this nucleotide, or, um, of these letters that represent nucleotides. So this portion of the DNA is actually a gene. So genes are portions of the DNA, and we know that they are called genes because they are going to code for a protein. Because in the cell, even though we have DNAs in our, in our nucleus, the DNA doesn't do the work in the cell. The DNA is going, is going to copy the information, the, the information of the DNA is going to be copied into an intermediate molecule called the RNA, and then the RNA, with, using the whole machinery of the cell, is going to produce a protein. And so it's the protein, the enzymes, that determine actually for example, the amount of pigments in the eyes that will give you a darker or lighter color, and so forth. And the same for plants. It's proteins who determine whether more structural proteins are going to be formed, say, to produce a larger leaf, or more pigments in the flowers, and so forth. So back to chromosomes and DNA. Who knows in this room how many chromosomes humans have, we humans have? 46. Yes. 46 chromosomes, very good. Humans have 46 chromosomes, and those chromosomes are actually, we can divide them in 23 pairs of chromosomes. So let's take, for example, chromosome number one. We have two very, very similar chromosomes number one. One of them comes from your mother, and the other one from your father. So this is how information passes from one generation to the other. We receive some of our information from one of our parents and the rest of the information from the other parent through the transmission of the chromosomes. And so when chromosomes come in pairs, there's a name, there's a term in genetics called diploid. Humans are diploids because they have chromosomes in sets of two. So 23 pairs or two sets of chromosomes is called a diploid. And that can be represented by 2N. Now, in humans, there's, we only have diploids, but in plants, we have larger sets of chromosomes. So we can have what are called polyploids, meaning that now these are organisms or plants that have more than two sets of chromosomes. For example, a triploid is going to have three sets, tetraploid four, a hexaploid six, and an octaploid eight sets of chromosomes. Uh, with their corresponding um, abbreviations or representations. Now, this mostly occurs in plants, but you may 
uh, want to know that in some animals, polyploidy also occurs. It has been found in insects, in amphibians, in fish, and just a few years ago, um, the scientific journal Nature reported a tetrapoid rat found in Argentina. Now, that was a first. We had never heard of a mammal that had a higher level than diploids. So, that's something to explore. Okay, why is it so important to have octoploid strawberries? Look at that huge difference. More sets of chromosomes, more genes, more matter being produced from those genes. Yes? I have a question. Does that mean, you know, if they have, like, for example, three sets of chromosomes, what does that mean that two, you know, two of those are from one parent and then another one from one parent, or is it all in all? It's always half from one parent and half from the other. Okay, so you couldn't have an odd number, it's always an even. It's usually an, an even number, but in the case of the triploid, it's usually, it comes from a cross of a tetraploid and a diploid. So this okay. parent gives you two, and this parent gives you one, and that's how you have the tri triploid. But then the triploid is usually sterile, because it won't be able to divide evenly. Okay, good question. Okay, so here is the beauty of polyploids. It's going to give us larger fruits, larger leaves, larger flowers. Which strawberry would we prefer to eat? <laughs> Definitely the large one. <laughs> so in plants, in plants, polyploidy is a natural event that occurred throughout evolution. We have apples and bananas that are triploid. Not all of them, but many of them are triploid. White potato, cotton, peanut, oats, um, excuse me, and peanuts are tetraploids. Oats are hexaploids, six sets of chromosomes, and sugarcane has eight sets of chromosomes. Yes? You said um, the preference to eat would be the uh, polyploid, but does that mean that it also produces the same ratio of, let's say, sugar to matter that would make the strawberry just as sweet as the smaller one? Uh, in general, yes, but as you know, there are many varieties of strawberries, so depending on what they, which one they started with. So some varieties have more sugar than others. Um, we know in general that when we manipulate um, plants to make them better, people usually go for the commercial characteristics. So if they are looking just for size, maybe they didn't pay attention to the sugars. That's why you will find that the larger strawberries are usually less sweet than the, short, the, the smaller ones. And then the other question would be, if a triploid would not, would be sterile, would a tetra or a hexa um, be sterile also, or would they still be able to produce, because you have the even pairing? They would be able to produce uh, proper gametes because they 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 are paired, so they always divide in two. As you will see later in the picture where I show the mitosis, where cell division is taking place. It's the it's the triploid that is the sterile one. Okay, and now going back to our topic of of the ornamentals in flower bulbs. We have all sets of all, or all kinds of ploidy. We have diploids, triploids, and tetraploids. Let's give an example of a flower bulb that has several levels of polyploidy, the daylilies. We can observe that polyploids in general in daylilies have flowers that are much larger. The flower color is much more intense. There's more vigor in the leaves and the stems as well. And very important, these uh, larger ploidy levels allow us to, do, to run breeding experiments that the diploids will not allow. And I'll go into more detail later. Right now, I just want to indicate that the breeding possibilities that polyploids offer are very, very good. 
There's other flowers, other species like rhododendron. Here's a diploid and a tetraploid. Here's a picture of a tetraploid. And these three are diploids. Not a large difference in size, and yet enough to make it desirable. Not only do the flowers grow in size, but also the stems in general. Here's ginger. You guys have had ginger cookies or kion, which we use in Chinese food. And you see that a diploid plant is smaller than a tetraploid plant. And the same with the roots. The tetraploid roots are thicker and more vigorous. So polyploidy is going to affect all the characteristics of a plant. Now, for the case of these flowers, these are the ones I'm working with. And we are, the project consists on doubling the chromosomes so I can take a plant from being diploid to a tetraploid. This plant is called Hippiastrum, and here's a picture of a diploid plant compared to a triploid flower. You can see the triploid flower much larger, prettier, fuller, much more um, marketable, and with tetraploidy, induced tetraploidy, the ornamental industry has been able to produce beautiful uh, variations in the flowers. Now, how do we double the chromosome number? So far, I have, uh, I have mentioned that this occurs naturally through evolution, but we can also induce it. And we can induce it using certain chemicals. And these chemicals are going to take are going to affect the plant at the cellular level. So two end cells are, be going, are going to be converted into four end cells. And of course, once the, the cells uh, increase in ploidy, we can generate the whole plant, and we have a whole plant or parts of the plant, plant that are tetraploid. So let's look in detail at what happens at the cell level. As you know, when, cell, when cells divide, they do it through a process called mitosis. Very good. Where the chromosomes, here's an example of a cell that has four chromosomes. It's a 2N, a diploid cell, has two chromosomes. And during the uh, metaphase phase of mitosis, the chromosomes duplicate until we can actually see them separating. If this were a normal cell, we would have that the top row of chromosomes would go to one side of the cell, and the bottom row would go to the, to the other end of the cell. And as they separate, the cells would then divide, and we have two identical cells generated from the mother cell. That's your normal mitosis. In the case of induction of tetraploidy, we can add a chemical to the environment where the cells are dividing, and we will have that the cells will not, the chromosomes will not be pulled to either end of the cell. Why? Because in order for the chromosomes to move to the poles of the cell, you need certain, you need what's called the spindle apparatus. You need the spindle fibers that are going to pull the chromosomes to either side of the cell. But these chemicals are going to bind the microtubules, which form the spindle fibers. So without the formation of the spindle, spindle apparatus, the cell, the, the, the chromosomes are not separated. And so now we have a cell that has duplicated its number of chromosomes. And that's how you produce tetraploids in the laboratory. What chemicals are used to induce chromosome duplication? We have two very, um, um, two th that are used normally or regularly in the lab. 
One is called colchicine and the other is oricelin. Colchicine was discovered way in the 1950s and it was used to produce all these new varieties of ornamental, tetraploid ornamentals. But uh, later it was found that it is toxic, not only for humans, but also for the plants themselves. So if you, say, expose 100 cells to colchicine, you're going to only get four or five that respond to it. Whereas if you use another chemical called oricelin, then you have a, a much better rate of success. So using oricelin or colchicine, we apply the chemical to the plants. There's two ways of applying the chemical to the plant. We can either use the whole plant in, in a pot, like in this diagram, or we can use plants that have been adapted to grow in the lab. Like in the case of this one, that is growing inside a petri dish that contains all the nutrients to allow the plant to grow. In the case of applying the chemical to the plant, we would mix, say, some oricelin with a little gel. gel. Um, it could be a petroleum jelly or anything that's gooey, and just put it on top of the terminal bud, which is the portion of the plant that generates new branches. In this case, for example, this branch was exposed to colchicine, and now, once it started growing, it has generated a tetraploid branch, whereas this other one is still diploid. So you can see larger leaves, larger fruits. And then we can take a cutting out of this branch, put it on a new pot, and then we have generated a tetraploid plant. In the lab, we would do something different. We would add the oricelin in the, as part of the culture media, and then when the plant is exposed to the media, all the cells that touch the chemical will then be induced to become tetraploid. And then those cells can be propagated, can be induced to propagate and generate tetraploid plants. So my project that I am carrying out with students, currently with students from St. Thomas, is in collaboration with the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture. There's a research station in Miami right next to Fairchild um, Botanical Garden. And they have a program uh, with ornamental plants. What they do not have is a tissue culture lab like we have here at St. Thomas. So they provide the material, we run the experiments, we will induce the tetraploid plants, and then they will help us in the phase of doing the breeding and generating the new varieties of uh, hippiastrum. Now, hippiastrum is a plant that looks pretty much like, a, like a, an onion. So it's a bulb, but if you cut it, it's going to be an onion. So we are starting with two end plants with diploid bulbs. And our purpose, our goal, is to generate tetraploid plants. And how are we going to do this? Or first of all, uh, what's the purpose of the project? First of all, we want to increase vigor in these hippiastrum plants. We want definitely to increase flower size to make it more marketable. But the most important purpose is that now the new tetraploid, tetraploid plants that, we'll generate, that we will generate, we can use them to cross them to, for fertilization of other tetraploid plants. And why would we want to cross two different tetraploid plants? We want to combine the characteristics. For example, say a tetraploid plant A has resistance to hot temperatures. That's very desirable because we can grow them in the tropics. And let's say tetraploid um, plant B has resistance to cold temperatures. That's great because now we can grow them all over the country or in, in the... Um, in, in areas of the country where winters are very harsh. 
If we cross those two tetraploid plants and obtain a progeny, we may be able to obtain a variety that has both characteristics. It will be able to grow in the winter and in tropical regions. So that's why we do breeding with these or different ornamentals. Now, if we were to take that diploid plant and cross it, like we were saying before, we would have a triploid plant that would either be sterile or sometimes incompatible, meaning that the cross is incompatible and it doesn't catch. It, you won't be able to get any seed. So um, in, in contrast, if we cross two tetraploid plants, our plants will, will be healthy and fertile, and we will have new varieties. These varieties may have increased resistance to diseases, or like I mentioned, increased resistance to harsh environmental conditions, or new colors. And so in our project, we have to be sure we cover all the stages properly. So at each point, we are sure we are moving forward to reach our goal of obtaining the tetraploid plants. So the first stage in our project is going to take, is going to be to take the plants and introduce them in the lab. We're going to give it conditions to work, um, conditions to grow well in the lab. And I have some pictures showing you the stage we're up to. We have already covered stages one and two. Stage two is going to consist in once the plant is in the lab, we are going to create a culture media or produce a culture media that allows us to propagate these diploid plants. And only then are we ready for stage three, which is going to be to duplicate the chromosomes. We're going to use oricillin. And then, as good scientists, we have to confirm that we indeed have a tetraploid plant. We cannot just assume that we have it. We have to use techniques uh, in, the, in the lab that will allow us to confirm that we have reached our goal of obtaining a tetraploid plant. And then we will, only then will we be ready for breeding. We're going to be crossing two tetraploid varieties. And then in the very last step, select some of the improved varieties. For, an, for our first step, what we do, we start with the bulb. We make cuttings of just small portions of the bulb, like, of the bulb, like you see here. These are called scales. It's just like peeling an onion and slicing it like, to, uh, like for making salsa. And we just take a little piece of that and put it in culture. Here we have two of our students, Jorge Verdesia and Vanessa Sanchez, working at the USDA preparing the cultures, introducing the small portions of the bulb into culture media. And we use different containers. Here are some Petri dishes. And so we have um, that once these grow, uh, excuse me, once they, these are ready, they need to go in the incubator. In the second step, we're going to have um, we're going to produce, uh, excuse me, we're going to prepare culture media with different variation because our goal is to induce rapid growth of these plants. So we add, we use culture media that contains not only macro and micronutrients that all plants need, but we add some hormones. And the hormones that we use in plants are of different types, some induce rapid growth of the stems, other induce rapid growth of the roots. So we are playing mostly with the hormone called BAP or benzylaminopurine that's going to induce rapid growth. We use different treatments and of course always a control, which would be a, a culture media that contains no hormones. And then we have to compare which of them gives us the best results. And all of our cultures will be stored in an incubator that's going to mimic the conditions that the plants would naturally have 
in the outdoors, and that is 25 degrees with 16 hours of light and 8 hour, hours of darkness per day. So that will mimic the day and night cycle. And for lights, we're going to use fluorescent lights. And here are some of our first results. We have that the initial portion of the bulb that we put in culture has, all, has apparently died, but not before it has produced a new green shoot. So this one is even giving us two shoots, and so now we are ready for the third stage. These, um, we call them explants, have been then are being transferred into culture media that contains different doses of the chemical that's going to induce the chromosome doubling, the orisolin. Here's also another large group of experiments that we need to design. We need to um, figure out how much orisolin we're going to use, for how long the, the exposure is going to be. Do the explants, can the explants stay the whole time on a risaline, or do we need to transfer them after a few days to new fresh media? How many days before transfer and all that? And all those are experiments that we can do with the students here. We are at this stage currently where we're going to, where we're starting to expose the explants to a risaline. Now, once we obtain this, um, tetraploid plants, how are we going to confirm that we have duplicated the chromosomes? Any idea, any suggestions? Yes. So say maybe a karyotype? Okay, a karyotype. A karyotype is a preparation of cells where you can actually see all the chromosomes and count them. And that's one very good way of doing it. And that's the way scientists did it in the past. You take your, your a little portion of the plant, you prepare what's called a squash, and then you look under the microscope and count your chromosomes. But as you can imagine, chromosomes are very tiny, it's a very time-consuming technique, and it sure makes your eyes tired after a while. So always moving ahead, scientists have come with an easier way of doing it. Now they use an instrument called the flow cytometer. This technique called flow cytometry consists on counting how much DNA or estimating how much DNA there is in the cells. And the output of this instrument is going to be a graph like this with certain peaks. And you see that what these peaks are estimating or are indicating are how much stain have, has the uh, DNA taken up because this stain is going to bind to the DNA. It's going to in, um, intercalate between the nucleotides. And so he, he, they are using here a standard. This chicken red blood cells is your internal standard, and that is for a diploid cell. So this peak represents diploid cells. This next one repre represents tetraploid cells, and this last one represents hexaploid cells. So just in a few hours, you can get your results. And that would be the way we will be using it. We will be doing it at the USDA. They have a very modern flow cytometer. And so the next stage then is going to be the breeding and selection of tetraploid varieties that will be done at the USDA. So as you see, with some knowledge of genetics, enthusiasm for your subject, like flowers in this case, uh, we, can, um, we can come up with very interesting projects that will show us a lot of the principles in that, um, that take place in, in plants or that plants follow to produce these uh, new varieties. So that's it. Are there any additional questions? Yes. I have one question. Um, you said that um, you put a chemical in the flower, like when it's, it still has two chromosomes. 
You put a chemical that binds the spindle fiber so that uh, the chromosomes divide and you end up with four chromosomes, but that the cell itself doesn't divide so that there's four chromosomes in one cell. Do you, once you do that, do you have to keep on adding that chemical as the cell divides, like continuously and permanently, or do you just add it once and when the cell divides, it stays like that? You actually only add it once because remember, the cell is not dividing, so uh, you have duplication of chromosomes. But then if you keep adding it, how, um, it's not going to grow because growth also occurs by division. So at some point, that cell is going to adapt and then start dividing. And in order to divide, it's going to have to duplicate itself. So if you put too much chemical, it's going to not allow your plant to grow. So you just do it once and then just wait. And it'll the city comes and sure like part of this genetic information to say, hey, when I divide, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to have four chromosomes now. Like, does it divide like that already? Yes, because once you have four chromosomes, each time that it produces, um, it goes through mitosis, it's going, four chromosomes will go to one side and four to okay. the other. It, it will follow normal mitosis, okay. but now its information has been changed and the chromosomes have been duplicated. Okay. Double, Thanks. yes. So the cell recognizes the chromosomes, it doesn't recognize it as anything that it's abnormal in the cell. It would just go back to interface and start the process of mitosis all over again naturally. Part of the cells will feel that they are normal. Part of them, if they don't feel, um, well, cells don't feel, but if there's any abnormalities, yeah. then those will die. So, so it's only a portion of your cells that survive. get that survive, and those are the ones we want. So that sometimes you have to take a plant and estimate the ploidy level on one area of the plant and then on another. You may have that you have a, a hybrid or a chimera, it would be called, where one part is tetraploid and the other is diploid. And so you would only go for the tetraploid because you, that's what you want. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention.